So folks, in this video, we'll finish up our introduction <clears throat> to the method of undetermined coefficients. I'd like you to answer number seven on your own. I guess it's a leading question because I say explain why not. But pause the video and think about the answer to that. And if you're stuck, go back to question number six, the one we worked just before this, to see if that gives you some insight. Why can we not just start trying to find the particular solution uh, to the non-homogeneous equation without first finding the homogeneous solutions. So go back, pause the video, reflect on number six, and let me know if you have any questions on that, because if you do, I'd love to talk about it. Thanks, folks. So now what I'd like to do is, without finding the general solution, let's go ahead and take a guess at the trial solution for this um, non-homogeneous ODE here. As a reminder, like we said in 7, we have to know what the solution to the corresponding homogeneous equation is before we can even do this. But we did this in a previous problem, and the solution to the corresponding homogeneous ODE was this. And if you're stuck on that, I got those uh, values from finding the roots of the characteristic equation to the corresponding homogeneous equation. So if you have any questions on that, let me know. But now that I know what my roots or what my solutions are to the homogeneous equation, I can now use that uh, information as I go to make my guess at the trial solution. So I think it's really important to reference back to parts A and B here when deciding what to use as your trial solution for the method of undetermined coefficients. And so what we do is we look at the structure of the right-hand side, and our trial solution should be uh, all linear combinations, that's the, the, the constant, uh, why we put a constant in there, all linear combinations of any functions that show up in this, as well as any derivatives that might eventually show up as we take successive derivatives of our, uh, if we were to take successive derivatives of our non-homogeneous term. So I hope that you feel okay with me for putting in this first part that our trial solution should contain an a sine of 3t. Now I need a 3t there. Um, there's no way we would generate a 3 in there without first having it. And so this, this hopefully should feel okay as a, as a part of a guess for our trial solution. That is, I would expect maybe there to be some sine terms in my solution, particular solution to this because if I take this function here, the derivative of that function, the second derivative, and I look at how everything combines, I'm hoping that what remains is a 5 sine of 3t after all that interaction between the derivatives and the function. But the other thing is, is that my trial solution should also contain any derivatives of this function. And the derivatives of this function also involve cosine functions. So I want linear combinations of cosine functions. So I'll put plus b cosine 3t. So this is our trial solution. We're not going to, in this case, and it's actually not particularly hard in this case, you could take the uh, first derivative of this, the second derivative of this, plug them into the corresponding uh, or co plug them into the original non-homogeneous ODE and then use this method of undetermined coefficients to solve for A and B. And once you have those, you have your particular solution, which you could then combine with the solution to the homogeneous equation to give your general solution to the original ODE. But I'm not asking you to do that in this problem. Here, I'm just wanting you to give the trial solution. And what I'm trying to reiterate because I find that students struggle with this, is this idea that I want to take into account all functions that show up in that forcing function, and in fact, all linear combinations of them, plus any uh, derivatives that could potentially show up as we take linear combinations, uh, or as we take uh, derivatives of that forcing function. And so in this case, I hope you feel okay with why we had to have an, a sine of three term, because we expect that when we take some derivatives of this and we do some canceling, we would maybe have something that remains that's a b sine of 3t, or a sine of 3t. We'd expect something like that to happen. But we also need a b cosine 3t, because that's a derivative term, and it's potential. That it's, there's a potential that our particular solution may need a cosine value. It might be that we find out that a is 5 and b is 0, or maybe 
a is zero and b is five, or maybe you know both of those coefficients are non-zero. We'll just have to wait and see. So I hope now this question makes sense. We're teaching this method of undetermined coefficients. It does not apply to all non-homogeneous linear ODEs. And in fact, we cannot use the method of undetermined coefficients for this particular forcing function here. I want you to pause the video and think about why that's the case and answer it. And I'll see you in a moment. So the reason why we cannot use the method of undetermined coefficients is if you were to start looking at secant of x, and if we were to take the derivative of this, we end up with the derivative of the secant of x is the secant of x times the tangent of x. And then if we were to take the derivative of that, we would get uh, taking the derivative by the product rule would give me uh, the first derivative of the second, so that would be secant cubed of x plus the second function times the derivative of the first, which would be secant x tangent squared x. And we see that if you were to keep taking derivatives, these expressions just keep ballooning, getting larger and larger. That is not at all like the previous examples that we looked at. When I take sine's derivative, I get cosine. When I take cosine's derivative, I get back to a sine uh, uh, up, to the, up to the plus or minus sign. Likewise here, when I take the, um, that's not a great example because of that, when I take the derivative of e to the 2t, uh, I get something e to the 2t. The derivatives begin to look very similar to the original functions. Or here, when I work with the polynomials, when I take the derivatives of a quadratic, I end up with a linear. When I take the derivative of a linear, I end up with a constant. When I take the derivative of a constant, I end up with zero. And if I take the derivative of zero, I just keep getting zero. So the derivatives eventually go to zero or eventually repeat themselves. And for this method of undetermined coefficients to work, we need that to be the case. So hopefully that explains why we cannot use the method of undetermined coefficients for this function here, although we will learn another method later on. So again, the issue is, is that the derivatives of secant of x don't eventually go to zero, nor do they ever repeat themselves. So it'd be impossible to list out the form that we would expect our particular solution to take, take as we use it as a trial solution. I hope that clarifies there. So finally, folks, over the last few years, I've had people really want a table for this. I actually disagree to using a table for the method of undetermined coefficients because I think that no table is going to be complete. There's no way I could show you all examples where the method of undetermined coefficients applies in just any one table. And it doesn't take into account what to do when you have the repeated, when you have the, the trial solution already showing up as a solution to your homogeneous equation. So it can give students a false sense of security using this table. Nonetheless, I've had some students ask for it. So I'd like you to spend some time uh, just looking through the trial solutions. If you're forcing function, so this is for maybe, uh, maybe we have just the, the uh, linear uh, ODE L sub y is equal to g sub x. So you've got your forcing function on the right hand side here. Just like up above here, our forcing function was secant x, or up above here, our forcing function was five secant or five sine three t. Given these various forcing functions, what would you use as your trial solution? So I hope it makes sense that if we have a linear function, our trial solution is linear. And if we have a quadratic function, our trial solution is quadratic, and that it continues. Hopefully, we saw in the last example why if you have a sine of four t or something like that you would want to take into account not only the any linear combination of this function but also any of the any of the functions this function's derivatives any of the linear combinations of this function's derivative which would include both not not only a sine of 4x but also a cosine of 4x that we'd be solving for notice that in this case then that means that our two trial solutions are the same here regardless of the forcing function we would just find different values for a and b as we did the method of undetermined coefficients. We looked at one where we had an e to the x, an e to the rx forcing function, and that was our trial solution. And then we have these other cases that we haven't yet dealt with. But again, it sort of fits the pattern in that I would expect, for example, if I have x squared e to the 5x, if I were to start taking derivatives of x squared e to the 5x, 
you were to take this derivative, you'd have to do the uh, product rule on this, as well as maybe a chain rule, but you'd have to do the product rule on this. And if we did the product rule on this, we'd have the derivative of the first times the second plus first times the derivative of the second, so that'd be x squared times five e to the five x. So notice that this gives me actually a linear e to the five x term. So that's why I also need a linear five x, uh, e to the five x, uh, term in my trial solution. Likewise, if I were to take another derivative, when I do this product rule right here, when I do this product right here, uh, this product rule right here, let's see here, we'd have the first derivative of the second, so that would give me 10x e to the 5x, and w plus uh, when I do the second times the derivative of the first, I get 2e to the 5x. Notice that this right here, and we, there are more to this, I'm not finishing it out, but this gives us a constant times e to the 5x, which is why our trial solution also includes a constant e to the 5x there. So hopefully that explains how this table works. It gets more complicated as you go along, but again, I feel that the most important thing to keep in mind is this statement 5a and 5b here. And if you can understand that, you can build the table. And even if you have the table, you won't be successful if you don't understand those rules. But anyway, there it is for you. Thank you, folks, and we'll see you in class.